This is Friday, February 3rd, 2017. We are at the Edith North Rogers Memorial Veterans Hospital in Bedford, Massachusetts. And this tape is part of the ongoing Veterans Oral History Project based at the Morse Institute Library in partnership with Natick Pegasus in Natick, Massachusetts. My name is Maureen Sullivan, and we are privileged to have with us today Arthur Palladino. Welcome, Arthur. Thank you. May I ask when you were born? 24 October, 1921. And where were you born? I was born in Revere, Massachusetts. What community do you currently live in? What community? I live in Arlington now. Okay. And your marital status? I'm widowed. Do you have children? Yes, I do. How many? Two. Any grandchildren? I have five grandchildren. How about great-grandchildren? And uh, almost four. <laughs> Congratulations. Tell us a little bit about life in Revere growing up. Not spectacular. I uh, never felt any fears. I really felt comfortable at home because I, had, I enjoyed good family life. Um, nothing spectacular. And what did your father do for a living? My father was a uh, shoemaker, cobbler, and uh, he made shoes for, for, uh, for people with crippled feet. He worked at one time, he worked for the Boston Shoe Hospital. The Boston Shoe Hospital? Yeah, it was a Boston Shoe Hospital, as I recall. Interesting. Yeah. And what do you remember about uh, the Great Depression? Very little, uh, because I didn't have the responsibility you know, of supporting a family or anything like that. But very little as far as I know. Uh, you know, my father worked all the time, so really didn't have uh, a hard time of it. And you graduated from Revere High School. Yes. In what year? Uh, 1939. And during the time you were in high school, were you made aware of events happening in Europe? I can't say that I was. I mean, I wasn't particularly interested, uh, but uh, until, you know, naturally it came time for me to go into service. You told me before the interview that your dad came over from Italy. Yes. Uh, did you ha did your family ever uh, have any encounters with uh, supporters of Benito Mussolini? No, no, not that I know. No, my father came over, I think, in 1913, so before Mussolini's time. You weren't recruited for any young fascist movement or anything like that? No, no. Okay. No. What did you do after you graduated from high school? After I graduated from high school, 1939, mm -hmm. I was working in a greenhouse in Rivera, and I think from there I gravitated into the service. I applied for military service. Okay. Arthur, do you remember where you were, where you were, and what you were doing when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor in December 1941? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was on a Sunday. Yes, it was. If I'm not mistaken, I, I think I was, uh, I was dating my uh, my wife at the time. 1939. Yeah. Okay, let's get into the start of the military service. Where and when did you enter the military? because I, I was conscripted from Revere. I, I had applied for, uh, for the Air Corps before that, but because of my weight, I was underweight at the time. Uh, I was turned down and told to put on some weight and then come back for, because I, I had I passed the uh, written, written interview and also, uh, and then I, I failed the uh, physical. So you put on some weight? I did, I, yeah. They said, 
So I said, well, what am I going to do? Said, Go home and eat some bananas. You know, put on, some, put on a few pounds and come back. Well, uh, when I, I went into the, I was conscripted into the service, and then I reapplied while I was in the service, and was accepted for uh, cadet training. What made you choose um, the Air Corps? Well, I, as a kid, you know, I was fascinated by airplanes. We had an air, we had a small airport in our city, and I spent considerable time with a friend of mine. We used to just, uh, you know, in our, our imaginations, flying. So now you get to start to get to do the real thing. I get to try to real, try it anyway. All right. How long were you um, in conscripted before you got accepted into the Air Corps? Well, I went through basic training first, mm -hmm. down in uh, uh, where was it, Louisiana, I think mm -hmm. it was, and uh, during my training there. I think I reapplied to the Air Force and was accepted. Mm -hmm. While you were down in Louisiana, was that the first time you were away from home? Seriously, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah yes. And tell us a little bit about BASIC. Well, the only thing I can remember about BASIC training was uh, where we were, I think it was. Uh, I forget the name of the place, the town in Louisiana, that we weren't allowed, we weren't allowed to exercise or train more than 15 minutes at a time without a break because it was so humid, so hot conditions were, you know, people were falling right out of the line because of mm -hmm. the heat. And wh uh, what year were you conscripted? 19, was it 41? Was it 41 or 40? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Was that before Pearl Harbor or after? Afterwards. Okay. All right, you're in basic in Louisiana. It's very humid. You reapplied for the Army Air Corps, and this time you got accepted. Yes. Do you remember uh, what time of year was that? Was it now 1942? Mm, not I'm not sure okay. of those days. Now, where were you sent for your initial training? Well, first I, uh, I, I applied for a flying school. Mm -hmm. uh, well, actually, uh, I applied, I have passed, well, one of the, I, I failed one of the exams, was uh, I guess one of the depth, the depth perception for, for pilots and uh, when I, I was at St. Louis at the time, and I asked uh, if there was anything I could do to improve my uh, depth perception, and he, asked, he said, well, perhaps you can have an operation on your eyes. Uh, so uh, what I did was I, uh, I, I accepted that. I went into a hospital for a week or so, and my eyes were operated on for uh, depth perception. Apparently the muscles on one, either up bottom or lower, or lower upper muscles in the eyes, are either too strong or too weak, so the eyes are pulled apart or, or put together. I, mean, yeah, I remember. I remember actually looking down at my cheek because my eye was outside of the socket. Yeah, they 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 were, uh, they were amazing. They said there was only one or two places in the country where they even try the operation because. Yeah, they hadn't been successful at that. You know, they they couldn't guarantee success. But any with the anyhow, I pa I passed it after the after a week or so. They retested my eyes, and they fell within the uh, the limit that they accepted. So I was accepted. I was accepted into the flying corps for flying training. Okay, you've got perfect eyes now. You've been accepted. Where well, are you? I don't want perfect eyes, but they're well, still there. So uh, yeah, they're still there. They're serving me. <laughs> Where? Uh, what happened next? Uh, well, what happens next is I went in. I went to uh, flying training school, and uh, at that time there was such a. Uh, 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 
large number of people that were trying to get into flying school. What they did was they limited to the, the, the top 35% of the class. And unfortunately, I didn't, I uh, wasn't included in that. Yeah, I, I had a Chinese, a Chinese instructor and uh, it had a very definite ask, <laughs> I don't know. He, he didn't teach me what, what I needed to know actually uh -huh. at the time because when I was tested by a, a test pilot, uh, I, I failed a pest apparently. I, I, I soloed, but uh, I just didn't make the grade. So anyhow, I sat around for a while in, uh, in Texas until uh, I, I was asked to apply, if I wanted to apply to Bombardier School, which I did. No additional operations this time, you got in, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I was young and foolish, you know. <laughs> okay, so and Bombardier School, uh, where was that? Sorry? Where was the Bombardier School? Uh, in Texas. In uh, Texas. And tell us what that was like. To what? I'm sorry? Tell us what Bombardier School was like. Uh, Bombardier School was a series of, of uh, training flights with, uh, you know, with a pilot flying and uh, teaching us uh, all kinds of math and uh, all about uh, uh, the uh, trajectory of bombs and the effect of air, air altitude and so forth. So we had to learn how to use the equipment that they gave us to mm -hmm. figure out uh, what size bombs we were carrying, how they were affected by the airflow, airspeed, altitude, a number of things that were affected. Mm -hmm. And then we, we had to learn the, uh, the uh, Norton bomb site, which was a very secret at the time. Mm. Uh, and uh, the, the bomb site had uh, a couple of uh, uh, tops, what do you call them? Uh, Spinning tops, what do you call Gyros? Gyros, yeah, they had gyroscopes in them. And uh, uh, what they did was they maintained the same attitude all the time, whatever you set. So we had to practice uh, uh, approaching a target. And uh, in the meantime, when we were uh, on the way to a target, uh, we took over the plane from the bomb site. And every, any adjustment we made in the bomb site was reflected in the attitude of the airplane. So uh, the idea was to get the uh, target and sit on it so that it didn't move at all. Then you knew that that's where the bombs were going to land. And how long did the training take? Uh, I think that uh, probably maybe three months or so. Okay. Yeah. And Arthur, what was your rank at the time you were in Bombardier School? I think I was rated as a cadet. As a cadet, yeah. I didn't get to be a second lieutenant until I graduated. Mm -hmm. And when did you graduate? In 1943 sometime, yeah. Okay. Now during the time you were in Texas, uh, did you get letters from home? Did you write letters? Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah. And uh, what you do for recreation? In Texas? Yeah. Uh, well, the, the time that we I was waiting to uh, to be assigned, reassigned to uh, to school, as I recall, we, we lived in Tent City. And uh, we counted the red widow spiders in the tents, the, red, the black ants, the fire ants, the chiggers, the, sna the poisonous snakes, and all the other uh, joys that uh, of uh, Texas life, you know, living out in the open. Because, uh, you know, there were men being shifted around. There were thousands and thousands of men that were constantly being shifted around and relocated and the war effort. And While you were being trained, to be a bombardier, were you being trained uh, for a specific plane, like a B-17 or a B-24? I 
I don't recall now. Uh, no, I, I'm not sure that that came into the picture. I know that l later on uh, I went to uh, Utah, Salt Lake City, Utah, mm -hmm. and that's where we uh, were assigned a crew. Okay. And that's where I met my crew for the first time. And uh, of course, by, by then we knew we were going to be in heavy bombers because mm -hmm. that's what we were flying in. And by heavy bombers, uh, was that a, like a B-24? B-24s, B yeah. Tell us a little more about a B-24. Like, was it, was it uh, good to ride in? Was it big? Was it small? Well, uh, of course, all the planes were designed to carry a bomb, a big, the biggest bomb load possible, mm -hmm. with the fewest number of men. But uh, we were a 10-man crew. And uh, quarters were tight, very tight, uh, on the ship uh, before we left the United States. Uh, I got married, and uh, I was buddy buddy by then with my navigator, and uh, he agreed to be my best man. So we came to Boston. I got married, and we we went back to Springfield, where we were stationed at the time. Mm -hmm at uh, the Air Force Base there. And uh, on the B-24, where would the bombardier be? It would be in the, in the front, in the nose. Okay, uh, in the my, nose. My job, my job was uh, the, uh, the bomb site, the, uh, I was, I was uh, an ambulance officer on the plane. So I had to check all the, all the uh, 50 caliber machine guns and also the bomb load to make sure all the bombs were secure before we took off. Because all, all the bombs have, had uh, nose fuses and in, the, in that fuse was a small propeller and there was a wire in there to prevent that propeller from turning because the bomb was not armed until the propeller turned a certain number of revolutions. So I had to make sure that all the wires were in place and the bombs were suspended the way they were supposed to be. What about the size of the bombs? Size? Yeah, like, um, was it like the size of your bed? Yeah, yeah, okay. some of them were small, some were larger, it depends mm -hmm. on on what kind of a target we were going to and what kind of confusion we tried to... And during your training, what were you being told about the Nazis? What were we being told? Well, I don't know if we were, what we were being told, but what we, you know, what was common knowledge of, what was common talk about stories we had heard, you know, things of that nature. That's why as, a, uh, as an officer on a ship, I was issued a 45 uh, for a firearm, but I never carried it on, on a mission because of the stories that go around about, you know, you being shot down and then uh, the uh, people getting to you first and shooting you with your own gun because these people were going through hell. Mm -hmm. You know, everyone was. Okay. Everyone. So your turn's coming up. You're stationed in Springfield. When were you sent and where? Well, from, uh, from Springfield, like I said, uh, uh, we went to uh, uh, Long Island. Mm -hmm. There was a, a field in Long Island, and that's where we took off to fly to uh, Europe. Uh, we, um, we went from Long Island went, uh, to Goose Bay, no uh, Labrador. And from there, from Labrador, we flew over to Iceland mm -hmm. by uh, so, uh, south of Greenland, by Iceland. And uh, we landed in Iceland. Uh, it was a heavy, heavy wind, strong, very strong wind. We couldn't take off, so 
they had to tie the planes down and we were delayed there for a week because the, of the inclement weather. When did you arrive, I'm assuming England? In England. Okay. Yeah, we, we, we landed in northern Scot Scotland. Northern Scotland. Uh, no, no, I'm sorry. Hmm? We were supposed to land in northern Scotland. And we, we, we land, for some reason or other, there was some kind of a hang up. We landed in Northern Ireland, where we stayed, uh, stayed for a month or so there. Okay, was, are we still in 1943 or are we now in 1944? No, it's 1944, because I got married in 1944, the oh, okay. February 1944. Mm -hmm. And you remember what time of year you landed in Northern Ireland? Uh, was it in the spring, summer? Well, we flew, we flew our first mission out of uh, England on D-Day. No kidding, wow. On June 6th. It was 1944. And we were shot down on August the 15th, mm -hmm. 1944. So we didn't spend much time in England. Okay. And uh, your first, what was your first mission? What was that like? Mm, no. I, I, you know, I, I, I have it recorded on, on the mm -hmm. list of, uh, of my flying, flying mm -hmm. time, you know. But uh, I don't remember my first mission, no. Okay. Uh, how many missions did, your, uh, did you go on before you were captured? 21 when we were shot down. Wow. I think that was, yeah, it was 21. Do you remember in general what kind of uh, targets? Yeah, they're all military targets that we went mm -hmm. for. We went from Berlin down to uh, down to Munich. Okay. We covered a lot of territory. Mm -hmm. Okay, tell us about the capture. You're on your 21st mission. Okay. Mm -hmm. As I say, a little, a little com comedy in there because normally, uh, normally what they would do is they would wake us up at 3 in the morning. Well, I don't have to tell you that uh, during the period of time where we were in combat, I mean, we were apparently hated by a lot of people because they were all trying to kill us. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, At, uh, at three o'clock in the morning, we, we, uh, we were usually awakened. Mm -hmm. And uh, normally what would happen is we'd go to, they'd send us a breakfast at three in the morning. And then we would go to, uh, for a, uh, a lecture to tell us exactly where the target was, or what to be on the lookout for, enemy planes, uh, as fact, and so forth and so on. So, um, after going through this procedure a few times, and uh, a few times, what would happen is that the weather around the target area would be bad. So we would hang around, hang around until it cleared up. But then, if it didn't clear up, the mission was aborted. Mm -hmm. So what a waste of time to change it from your out of your pajamas. So I said, I'm not changing it out of my pajamas. So. Probably the only guy in, in existence that ever shut down his pajamas. <laughs> so I, you know, so I went to, I got my, uh, I got a, what we had was, we had an electric flying suit, and we had uh, uh, sneak, uh, sneakers, not sneakers, but they were they were like uh, slippers, you know, light slippers. They were plugged into the legs, and then the the pants was plugged into the jacket, and so forth. So we were electrified, and then we got in the plane. We plugged into the plane's electricity supply, and that kept you warm because we were up at uh, at uh, high altitude. Uh, so uh, when I, when uh, the auto, uh, when we were flying and I, we were being attacked by the uh, German planes, uh, usually uh, the fighters would fire uh, their light machine guns with tracer bullets, and uh, I could see the tracer bullets underneath because I was in the, t the nose turret. I could see the tracer bullets, so I knew we were being hit because when, as soon as they see pieces of the plane chip off, they fire a cannon to knock you down. 
So that's what was happening at that time. And I saw the tracer boats. I knew that we were being hit. And then the pilot gave the, the, the order to bail out. So I climbed down out of the nose door and, uh, and, uh, and jumped. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Do you remember where you landed? Well, uh, we were in the vicinity of this German airfield, fighter airfield. And uh, I landed in the vicinity of the airfield. Before I landed, because of the shortage of fuels, uh, the Germans had very, very shortage of fuel. So what they would do is come up and make a pass and go back and land again before they ran out of fuel. So uh, the, uh, uh, I see a German pilot came around. He was going in to make a landing. So, you know, I, I wanted to be buddy-buddy with him right away because uh, I heard stories of him you know, shooting down the parachutes. So I, I don't know if I waved or saluted or something. But anyhow, when I looked down at the uh, landing field, uh, I could see the gun crews at either end of the, r the runway, and uh, they were shooting. One of our uh, P-38s came in to shoot up, to shoot them up, and they must have hit him at the end of the runway, and he flipped over and down on his back and exploded on the runway. Wow. Yeah, uh, I hit I hit the ground, and it was immediately picked up by a Dutch uh, soldier, and uh, and taken into the local jail. Of course, I'm still hiding my pajamas. Which meant you probably didn't have any insignias underneath. I well, I no, I just had pajamas and oh, so pajamas and my flying suit. Uh -huh. Now when I jumped out of the plane, uh, the slipstream took my uh, boots, my flying boots away. So I landed with just slippers. That's why I hurt my legs, my feet. All right, you're in your pajamas. Yeah, I'm ready to go to bed again. Oh dear. And you're in the, one of the local jail. Uh, did any other members of your crew make it? I never saw any of the members of my crew for the entire time I was there. Oh. They disappeared because the first thing they did after uh, they took me out of the uh, jail, they took me to an interrogation center. And I spent a couple of weeks there at the interrogation center where they tried to talk me out of uh, you know information. Um, I gave I, you know, the usual story about name, rank, and serial number, and uh, kept threatening me with the fact that uh, the, uh, the uh, what do you call it, the strong arm group of the uh, Gestapo. The Gestapo I was going to come in and take over. Mm -hmm. uh, what can I do? Mm -hmm. What can I do? So, um, anyhow, after a couple of weeks, I. I began to think that they were they were actually telling me the truth that they were going to send me to Gestapo, and uh, they picked me up and took me to. I went through Germany, traveled through Germany until I got to uh, Stalingrad One, up in the Baltic Sea. So this is August 1944. You're now a prisoner in Salak Luft 1 on the Baltic Sea, and we actually have a couple of interviews in the collection from folks who were also interred at Salak Luft 1, and they remember it was windy, it was cold. Mm -hmm. How about you? The windy what? It was windy and cold. Well, this is, it was on the edge of the Baltic Sea, mm -hmm. in the north. Were you given a uh, any kind of clothing, or are you still in well, your pajamas here? I, well, because I, I had my pajamas, I was the envy of the camp. Mm -hmm. uh, I know, um, I, I can't, I remember got, you must have gotten some clothing, mm -hmm. but I never had an overcoat. I remember standing out in the freezing cold on the uh, Germans' counters every morning, you know? And, uh, no, I, I didn't have an heavy, heavy coat or anything. Did they take your flight suit? What? Did the Germans take your flight suit? They must have. I can't remember. Okay. Uh, yeah. 
All right, so now you're in Starlock Loop 1, I, uh, where you were assigned to a barracks? Yes. And how many other people were in the barracks with you? You know, as I recall, I think that we, we ended up with a maximum of 20, 24. I think there, there are details of uh, the barracks there and also how many men were there and, and a lot of other details mm -hmm. too that I've forgotten. Now, as an, you're in an officer's camp, which means you weren't being forced to do any labor That's right. for the Germans, yeah. uh, what were the activities like? Well, there, there were, uh, of course, uh, for, uh, except for the underground activities, there were underground activities. We had, we had a newspaper in the camp, and we also had a radio, and the parts were supplied by German guards. You know, for cigarettes and mm -hmm. from bartering and trading and so forth. Actually, at times, uh, it looked like they were the prisoners and we were, we were the guards, yeah. Mm -hmm. But uh, they, they had some semblance of authority. They had some people in command at times that uh, we respected uh, German, the German officers. Mm -hmm. But there were times when they were just uh, selected because of their ability to speak English or understand English. A lot of them had been in this country, you know. What was the food like? The food like? Well, it, it went from, uh, oh, I can say from bad to worse. Uh, the food supplied by the Germans, at first we had some, maybe some uh, dead horse meat, uh, things of that nature, uh, cabbage, uh, rutabagas, rutabaga. I never even knew what a rutabaga was until I got in the German prison camp. Yeah, and then I lusted after them after I was, was so hungry that I couldn't, I couldn't walk. Uh, of course, I, I didn't have any shoes, you know, and uh, I was at a uh, dis dis disadvantage. And my ankles were swelled up like balloons. Yeah, cause I, land, I landed pretty hard. Yeah. yeah. In fact, there was a second time I had to bail out over England, too. A second time? Yeah, we, uh, we were on a practice mission one day, and all four engines cut out. The pilot gave the order to bail out, and we had 2,000 feet. So uh, I had to bail out, and uh, it caught in. I, well, luckily, I landed on a road, but the road I hit hard on the road is slamming down. And then I was picked up by a, by a recon car that was on the way to our, our camp for, they were going for recreation mm -hmm. because of some important, I think it was uh, the, the, the band leader there, uh, they got killed. What was his name? Oh, Glenn Miller. Glenn Miller? Glenn Miller, yeah. Okay. He was headed to our camp to get, and uh, they were they were going for entertainment, you know. So uh, they pick, uh, they, they stopped. And fortunately, I said, "Oh my, it was a piece of luck." So they stopped and picked me up. And uh, unfortunately, uh, I sat in the first the front seat. And then I heard, what the heck was that? I turned around. I heard a click. A gun up against the back of my head, because at that time there were a lot of stories going around about. Germans inf infiltrating England, you know, in the English uniforms, you know, trying to upset the, uh, uh -huh. committing, you know, all kinds of problems, and, and so uh, they, had, you know, and unfortunately, no, yeah, unfortunately, I didn't have any fine identification because we were told never, never to tell, carry identification. So, you know, those are crazy times, crazy times, you know. I wonder we all get through it. <laughs> well, let's get you back to loop, uh, Starlock Loop 1. And uh, what about Red Cross packages? Did you folks ever receive those? We had, uh, we were supposed to be distributed uh, Red Cross packages uh, once a week, I think. Uh, the Germans helped themselves naturally. Mm -hmm. Couldn't help, you couldn't, uh, you know, couldn't stop them. And uh, once in a while we'd have two packages to a man and then no packages at all, and depending on the uh, on where the uh, 
the fighting was going on, you know, because all the fighters were up there all the time shooting plane down the trains, preventing uh, movement. Mm -hmm. As there's no movement, uh, you don't get any packages. So it has its purpose and it doesn't. Mm -hmm. And you spent the, at least the winter of 1944 in the Stalag, am I correct? Uh, that's right. Yeah. And you had no shoes, you well, no overcoat. No, I, I got shoes when I, when I somehow or other in the camp. Uh-huh. Uh, somehow or other I, I managed to get a, get a pair of shoes, but I, I never had an overcoat. Uh, mm -hmm. um, Did the Germans issue you uh, like at least a blanket and pillow? Well, the German blanket, like everything else, was airsatz, which meant it was manufactured out of thin air, actually. Ah. Yeah. They, they may do with them some the people. You have to sympathize with the people in the country mm -hmm. because that's what they were living on. Like, they were depending on us for cigarettes in the camp mm -hmm. because, uh, you know, shortage of tobacco and whatever. That must have been one tough winter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So let's get you over to the spring of 1945. Okay. And were you getting news from the outside at this point through your newspaper or radio? We were getting, uh, yeah, we were getting shortwave radio because of uh, they had a clandestine uh, radio in the camp. Uh, it was hidden, and also it was, they circulated a small newspaper to get to pass the news around. Did you know about the Russian advance? Yeah, we were released by the Russians. Okay. They got to, they got to us first. And when were you released? It must have been in, uh, in May of 1945, yeah. Okay. And tell us about that day. Was it like the Germans were around one day and oh, then the next morning it, gone? It was, uh, yeah. Well, the German German guards had left the night before, mm -hmm. and uh, the uh, Americans were in our camp. We sent our people down to uh, to, to, uh, to contact the advancing Russians, and they set up a you know, pact between them to the understanding that you know we were uh, allies, and uh, uh, how to approach the camp and. Uh, they were different. Their, their army is a lot different than ours. Okay. It's now May 1945. The camp has been liberated. Mm -hmm. what, hap uh, what happened afterward? Were you sent back to uh, West? After the Russians uh, liberated us, actually. Of course, the guys some of the guys couldn't take freedom, naturally. So we had all kinds of uh, uh, things going on in camp, you know, guys who had heard a bunch of, a bunch of the, the ex-prisoners of war had left for Paris by themselves. Uh, there were others that were, they had uh, uh, captured uh, uh, st horses, you know, uh, to drive automobiles, cars, and things of that nature. And they disappeared into the uh, into the woodwork. You know, I don't know what happened to them. A lot of them got to Paris. They got eventually got liberated. But uh, we stayed we stayed in the camp together with as a base unit. And uh, after uh, I don't know how, how long it was that uh, the Americans we, we had uh, about a mile away from where we were. They had a, a flag school, a German flag school and they had a landing strip there. So what they did was they flew in American B-17s to the strip, and uh, we were assigned to planes and flown back to, fr flown to France. And what happened once you got back to France? Well, we, we stayed in France uh, and we were fed special diets, try to get our stomachs back to normal again. I think it was Camp Lucky Strike, they called it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We flew back to France, and like I say, after 
an indeterminate amount of time. I don't remember, I, my memory fails me as, as the length of time, but uh, we waited for transportation of any kind and all of a sudden an opportunity came up. There were, was a ship for, uh, that was going to go back to the to, uh, United States. There was landing, there was uh, landing there and it had all uh, uh, wounded personnel on it. And, but they had some, some room, so they were taking some certain number of prisoners. So um, fort I was fortunate in getting on that ship. I came right to Boston. Yeah. And of course, before I left, they told me, make sure you don't take anything you know, with you because you'll be in big trouble when you get to Boston. I could have taken the, the, the Eiffel Tower with me. They never would have asked me. I just got cut on the boat and they got off the boat. Mm -hmm. That was it. So I said, well, thank God for that. At least I'm home. You know. And you got reunited with your wife and your family. Yeah, after a few days, uh, my, my wife and her brothers came to meet me out uh, the Camp, camp Miles Sandish. Oh, yeah. down in Plymouth, yeah. Camp Miles Sandish. Yeah. Okay. So, Arthur. When, uh, when were you discharged from the military? Was it right after that or yeah, a few no, months down the was, road? No, no, after that. Okay. Because I had been a prisoner of war, they gave me and my wife, I don't know, a week or two weeks leave so at uh, 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 New Jersey. Mm -hmm. What was it? Uh, what was it for? Atlantic what? City? Atlantic City. Oh, okay. Atlantic mm -hmm. City, yeah, that's right. Yeah. And then after that, I had to go back to to Pennsylvania. And that's where I was uh, given my discharge. Yeah. And what rank were you at the time of your discharge? Second lieutenant. Still second lieutenant. Okay. And do you remember what medals or commendations you received? Well, uh, as my, my daughter was asking me too. Is I, I know I got the the uh, uh, flying medal, the air medal, uh, with uh, uh, two or three oak leaf clusters. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think they gave you oak leaf cluster for every seven missions or mm -hmm. so. I don't remember what it was, mm -hmm. but I know I get that, and uh, they issued a prisoner of war medal. The usual junk that they gave you. Know, <laughs> did I, Dick? Uh, uh huh. You know, good soldier. So, All right. Yeah. And after um, after your discharge, did you join any military organizations such as the VFW? No, I I, I wanted to join. The, I had in mind I wanted to join the uh, reserve, mm -hmm. and, but I didn't. I didn't. And fortunately, I didn't because. Right after that was another war, mm -hmm. and I would have been all trained, <laughs> ready to go. Yeah, so, the other side. Yeah. So what did you do um, after you left the military? Well, let's see. I, I went to work for an insurance company. Yeah. And then I, and then I went to work for. Uh, Where was that? Uh, tobacco, tobacco company. Okay. Yeah. I was a salesman. And then finally, uh, I, I worked for General Electric and Lynn. Okay. Uh, uh, as a, uh, as a, uh, what the heck was it? Uh, Jack of all trades. Mm -hmm. But I had, a, I had a good job there in Lynn. In Lynn. Uh, in the aircraft engine factory. Nice. Like aircraft engines, fighters. Uh huh. So, Arthur, uh, before we wrap up this interview, do you have any other uh, recollections of your uh, days in the military? Any other stories? Well, I mean, like I said, uh, it wasn't the first time that I had a bailout. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, the first time I bailed out was when we were on a practice mission yep. in England, mm -hmm. and uh, we were only about two thousand feet, and the pilot says bail out. What happened? 
all engine, all four engines cut out on us. Wow. So we, we bailed out over England, and mm -hmm. like I say, I got, that, that turned out all right. Another yeah. time, we got shot up so badly that uh, uh, we didn't have any brakes because uh, everything on the, on the, on the uh, B-24 was, uh, was uh, operated by one unit. Mm -hmm. We lost all our brake pressure, steering pressure, but fortunately, the pilot was able to land the plane, and uh, we had all the men in the tail end to try to pull the tail down to keep it, drag the tail down the runway, all the weight of the uh, black suits, and uh, holes all through the plane, I mean, holes we had in the plane. Amazing. And we shot up pretty badly. Yeah. yeah. I'm still here. Yeah. Well, Arthur, is there anything else? Uh, how important was it for you to serve in the military? How important was it to me to serve in the military? Well, uh, I wouldn't want to repeat it again, but having having been through it, I, uh, I made a lot of friends, a lot met a lot of good people, and uh, uh, I, I enjoyed myself. I'm afraid I enjoyed myself at times. I was afraid to say that, but. Uh, the first thing that comes to mind when I think of the military is fear, mm -hmm. because uh, well, we were flying, and that was the order of the day. There were no, 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 no atheists in foxholes, like mm -hmm. they say, in that school. Okay. Well, Arthur Palladino, we thank you so much for taking part in the Natick Veterans Oral History Project. Thank you.